Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us today for this uh, HPTN hosted webinar on COVID-19, which is the topic of the hour and unfortunately of the past week and weeks to come. I'm Neeru Sista, I'm the director of the HPTN and Leadership and Operations Center at FHI 360. And we are joined today by Dr. Wafael Sarer and Dr. Mike Cohen, our HPTN PIs, Eric Miller, Senior Communications Officer for HPTN, and Jess Dr. Jessica Justman, who will present on COVID-19. Dr. Justman is the Senior Technical Director at ICAP and Columbia University, and Associate Professor of Medicine in Epidemiology in Columbia at the Columbia Mailman School of Public Health in New York. She's also the site leader for the Bronx Prevention Center Clinical Research Site, which is also an HPTN site, and an attending physician in the Division of Infectious Diseases at the Columbia University Irving Medical Center. We are fortunate to have Dr. Jess Jasmine join us today, who will present a, a brief talk on COVID-19. After that, we will open the session for question and answers. We'll please send us your questions through the chat box. Everyone's muted, so please send us your questions through the chat box and we will monitor them. Uh, Dr. El Sader and I will then moderate the Q&A so that all, most of your questions will be answered. So without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Justman and uh, thank you again for joining us. Thank you, Nero, and um, good morning and good afternoon and, and good evening to everyone. I'm, I'm really pleased uh, to be able to give you uh, this talk on COVID-19 updates um, and, uh, you know, have a question and answer session at the end. I have no financial disclosures. So um, here's the overview of the talk. Um, we're going to cover a wide range of aspects, um, but briefly in about 30 minutes, we'll start with uh, the virology and epidemiology of the infection, um, go quickly through major clinical features, um, updates on diagnostic testing, and then we'll move to um, interventions, starting with public health measures, treatment trials, post-exposure prophylaxis, and vaccines. What is the novel coronavirus? I think probably many of us already are um, familiar with this, but just um, to cover the basics, coronaviruses are large envelope positive strand RNA viruses. There are about 50 known strains that um, infect mostly birds and mammals. Uh, seven strains are known to infect humans. Four of these account for about 10 to 30% of all common colds and three strains are known to cause epidemics. They um, are zoonotic epidemics, meaning the infection jumps from an animal reservoir, um, in this case, generally bats, to humans, going through an intermediary host, um, for example, civet cats or camels, as was the case with the first two coronavirus epidemics. The name of the virus is not the same as the name of the disease, and the chart below lays this out for you in more detail. Um, just um, to be brief, we'll focus on the, the bottom line in bold. Um, the name of the current novel coronavirus is Severe Acute Respiratory Syndrome Coronavirus 2, um, abbreviated as SARS-CoV-2, or sometimes you'll see it as the 2019 N for novel coronavirus. And then you can see on the right of the chart, um, the name of COVID-19 is derived from coronavirus disease 2019. Um, now, in terms of the structure of the virus, you can see from the diagram on your right, there's an outer fringe um, or corona, which means crown in Spanish, of embedded proteins, including the spike S protein, which I have an, in a red circle there, um, that's embedded in a lipid envelope, which is a lipid membrane. How does the SARS coronavirus 2 bind to cells? Well, if you look at the um, image on your right, which is um, 
uh, from X-ray crystallography of the um, S protein, um, you can see in the red circle the portion of the virus that binds to the receptor, which is at the top, because the bottom of the image shows you how it's embedded in the viral membrane. So the S protein binds to an angiotensin converting enzyme 2 called an ACE2 receptor. Um, ACE2 um, receptors are found widely throughout the body, but in particular, um, it's quite frequently found on the surface of lung alveolar epithelial cells and also on the surface of enterocytes um, that line the small intestine. Um, this S protein of the SARS coronavirus 2 binds the receptor, the ACE2 receptor, with a higher affinity than the SARS coronavirus 2, uh, SARS coronavirus S protein from the 2002 epidemic. Now, one might like to think that this tighter binding would explain the epidemiology and the clinical presentation that we are seeing with the current epidemic, but we actually don't really know enough to say that for sure. Moving on to the epidemiology, let's start with a global snapshot. Um, these numbers um, are um, current as of yesterday afternoon. I did check this morning, and of course they've all changed, but I did not update the slide further. Um, but there, uh, as of yesterday afternoon, were 685,000 confirmed cases globally with 32,000 reported deaths um, and 145,000 reported recoveries. I have an asterisk there next to deaths, just to um, briefly comment that the whole um, effort to calculate and to estimate um, case fatality rates is, is more difficult than it would seem. Can simply look at uh, deaths in the numerator over total confirmed cases in the denominator and get a very rough estimate of mortality. Um, but these numbers are going to shift as the epidemic progresses. Um, in the box um, there on the lower part is just a, a way to look at how the cases are distributed by region. Um, there are now 12% of global cases in China. Um, about half of all global cases are um, in Europe. And 18% of global cases are in the US, with New York City, where I'm speaking to you from, um, having about a quarter of all US cases. And um, right now, less than 1% of the global cases are in Africa. So how does COVID-19 spread? Well, it spreads from person to person, uh, primarily through respiratory droplets, which are produced during coughing or sneezing. Um, this really requires close contact with an infected person, and close contact is defined as being within two meters for um, 10 minutes or more. Um, contact um, is another way of um, spreading the disease. This can be direct or indirect and involves touching a surface or an object that has the virus on it and then touching one's mouth, nose, or eyes. But this is not thought to be the main way the virus spreads. Uh, the WHO um, has similar guidance to CDC's guidance on um, patterns of spread in terms of respiratory droplets and contact being the major way of spread um, and that airborne spread is not believed to be a major driver. So a little bit more on respiratory droplets. Um, these are produced when a person coughs or sneezes um, and respiratory droplets are moist particles um, with mucus and saliva um, and of course with virus if the person is infected and are generally um, five microns or greater. It really can be a very wide range of sizes. Um, aerosol droplets um, are smaller in the one to five micron range but also contain some moisture. Just for comparison, a red blood cell is seven microns in size. Um, Droplets are larger um, than the particles involved with airborne transmission because these are primarily um, evaporated droplets or even dust. Um, one topic that's been in the news quite a bit has been um, the question of how long can the SARS coronavirus 2 live on surfaces. Um, this uh, correspondence was published in the New England Journal. Um, that looked at aerosol and surface stability of the virus um, 
our current coronavirus 2 compared with coronavirus 1. Um, and in this experiment, um, researchers looked at the viability um, of the virus for up to three hours in aerosols, which were less than five microns. And they found um, that at the end of the three hours, the um, aerosol um, was, did still contain viable virus, um, although the titers decreased with each hour. They also found that um, coronavirus was viable um, on copper, cardboard, and plastic and stainless steel for different amounts of time, as shown on the slide. Um, but that in every case, the amount of virus did <clears throat> decrease over time. This data support um, uh, the conclusion that respiratory droplets, namely aerosol and contact transmission is plausible as the virus can remain viable for multiple hours and on surfaces for up to days. I'll note that this is a um, highly experimental, artificial, if you will, laboratory model. Transmission was not assessed, and one cannot just assume that viability in aerosol droplets means that transmission is airborne. What about preventive measures? Well, these involve primarily personal protective equipment, referred to as PPE, um, and hand washing. Uh, WHO recommends using a mask if you're coughing or sneezing or have other mild coronavirus-like symptoms or are caring for someone suspected of having a coronavirus infection. Um, an N95 mask can help to limit the spread of some respiratory diseases, but it's not enough to stop all infections. And then there's a diagram at the bottom that shows the difference between surgical masks, which does not filter all droplets, and an N95 mask that will filter 95% of airborne particles um, up to the size of 0.3 microns if worn correctly. The best precautions are simple, to wash your hands frequently, try not to touch your face and avoid crowded places and stay at least a meter or two away from other people. Um, this image um, on your right shows in with a darker red the areas more likely to be missed when hand washing. So, You've probably heard um, the recommendations to pay attention to your thumbs um, and the tips of your middle and ring finger. Um, I'm including this study on transmission um, among household contacts. It's a preprint study, um, meaning it hasn't completed peer review and hasn't been published yet. Um, but it looked um, very carefully at about 400 cases and about 1,200 of their close contacts in Shenzhen, China. And they found that household contacts and those traveling with a case were six to seven times more likely to develop infection than other close contacts. Very interestingly, the household secondary attack rate was 15%, um, so much lower than the kind of attack rates one would see with measles or chicken pox, which is 90%. Um, and here in this um, study, children were as likely to be um, as infected as adults. Um, these attack rates um, also um, uh, make us think about the basic reproductive number, um, referred to as R0. This is the average number of infections produced by one infected person. Um, and the estimate for COVID-19 is one and a half to four. It depends on the location. R0 um, is really driven by three things, as you can see from the equation at the top of B times C times D. And we have some control over two of these three things. B refers to the per contact transmission probability, which can be reduced by hand washing. C refers to the average number of susceptible infectious contacts, and this can be reduced through social distancing. And D is the average duration of infectiousness. And unfortunately, we don't have anything yet that will reduce that. The idea is to reduce R0 to less than one in order to um, stop the spread of an epidemic. Here on your right is a chart that shows you just visually um, different r naughts for different infections. I won't go through them all, but um, it's certainly quite um, helpful to see for measles, it's 11 to 18. Um, for HIV, it's somewhere between um, three and a half and four. Um, so that just helps put the COVID 19 R naught of one and a half to four into context. So moving now to um, clinical presentation, um, these are data from almost 45,000 confirmed COVID-19 cases um, in mainland China. 
um, as of early February, and it shows the prognosis by initial clinical presentation. Um, so looking at the chart, um, starting on your left, you can see that um, about 80% of um, individuals presented with either mild or moderate illness, and that was kind of half and half. Um, another 14% percent presented with severe disease, um, namely a more advanced pneumonia, and 5% presented with critical illness requiring intensive care unit um, or, or ventilator support. As you move across the diagram, the green arrows show you the approximate percentages who recovered, and the red arrows um, show you the approximate percentages um, who did not recover and who died. And in each case, the arrow, as you move down, gets thicker and thicker until you can see approximately half of those who presented with critical illness, unfortunately, did not recover um, but died. The average incubation time is five days with a range of two to 14. Um, and recovery time from this publication was described as between five to 32 days after symptom onset. From other sources, um, I have seen the description that for most mild to moderate cases, it takes about two weeks to recover. For more severe illness, it can take three to six weeks to recover. Um, just including um, from the New England Journal, the um, detailed clinical features among one uh, case, the first confirmed COVID-19 case in the US. Um, and I won't go through all of it, but just to show that um, the duration of fever was about 10 days in this case, um, which was then abbreviated when the patient received um, on compassionate use um, an experimental drug, remdesivir, which we'll talk about in a few minutes. Um, and you can see the um, persistence of the cough in the orange bar right under fever. Um, how do coronavirus tests work? Um, well, right now, all laboratory diagnostic tests currently rely on molecular testing called um, real-time polymerase chain reaction, which is performed at commercial state or city labs. The specimens um, are used for testing um, are primarily nasopharyngeal swabs, but can include other samples that are listed there on the slide. Um, the test that CDC developed um, takes about six to eight hours to complete um, and was capable of uh, running 50 to 100 tests per day. Uh, the Roche Cobus and the Thermo Fisher platforms um, take only about four hours to complete, but they can handle many more samples per day depending on the platform. Rapid point of care testing um, has now um, uh, come onto the scene and it relies on um, molecular testing as with PCR to detect an active infection. Currently two have been approved by um, the FDA under an emergency use authorization. Um, the Cepheid Expert um, uh, test uses the Gene Expert platform, which takes 45 minutes to run um, it can handle a wide range of samples depending on the particular system. Um, there are 23,000 instruments worldwide, including quite a few in Africa. Um, the cost of the cartridge at this point is um, still unknown. Um, just in the past couple of days, Abbott um, uh, announced that it had developed the Abbott ID Now uh, COVID-19 test, which is faster from only five to 15 minutes to complete but it can only run one sample at a time. There are about 18,000 of these instruments in the US and the cost per test is not yet known. Both of these instruments are used routinely for influenza A, B, strep and respiratory syncytial virus um, in the US. And here's just a quick snapshot of testing to date in the US um, and gives you an idea of the number of positive in red uh, negative in gray and total samples um, handled in blue. And certainly the first half of March, almost uh, nothing was really happening in a, at a substantial level. And just really in the past week has the um, capacity of testing um, really picked up. Home testing may be the new frontier. Um, there are a number of test kits available online. Um, these do rely on self-swabbing. Turnaround time varies. None of these are FDA approved yet, and the FDA has warned against their use until approved, as 
test performance has not been validated. Um, are antibody tests being developed? The answer is yes. Um, ELISA tests, um, including point of care rapid tests for detection of both IgG and IgM are being developed and are moving to the market. Um, these measure the presence or absence of antibodies to the virus in people's blood um, and gives evidence that the immune system has encountered the virus. There are many benefits to having this kind of test. You can get an accurate picture of how many people have been infected through seroprevalence studies, can identify people with immunity who might be able to care for COVID-19 patients at zero or minimal risk, um, and you can identify people without immunity who would benefit from a future vaccine. And lastly, this would identify newly recovered patients with high antibody levels who could donate their antibody-rich blood, known as convalescent plasma, to potentially save other patients with severe COVID-19. Sorry, that's a double. Um, and just, um, I think I've got my slides slightly out of order, um, but I wanted to just uh, say a little bit more about clinical presentation. Um, for pregnant women, NICS data suggests minim minimal evidence of vertical transmission based on three small clinical series um, and one case study of possible vertical transmission. Um, however, there have been reports of neonates acquiring COVID-19 um, from secondary transmission. Um, for children, um, including here a study of 74 hospitalized children in China, um, the predominant symptoms were cough and about a third and fever also and just a little under a third. And their presentation um, could be divided into three categories with about um, one quarter being uh, asymptomatic, another one third having acute upper respiratory tract infection, and about 40% having a mild pneumonia. Um, the good news was that the median hospitalization duration was only 11 days. And then another um, question has been, how do people living with HIV do? Um, and there's limited inf information regarding COVID infection or outcomes, but overall data do indicate higher death rates for older persons and those with comorbidities or who are immunocompromised. Um, CDC um, gave specific COVID-19 recommendations for people living with HIV um, to ensure an ample medication supply, keep vaccinations up to date, to establish a plan for clinical care if isolated or quarantined, and to maintain a social network. For all three of these groups, pregnant women, children, and people living with HIV, I have to say the data still is really quite sparse. Um, so I think more remains to be seen, but in each case, um, we have not yet seen any early evidence that um, these three groups have a more severe outcome. What is the risk of reinfection? This is a question that comes up quite a bit. Um, and I will say again that the data are limited, um, but reinfection appears unlikely this is based on a non-human primate um, monkey model with rhesus macaques that showed no potential for SARS coronavirus 2 reinfection in two very rigorously studied macaques. Um, and the other um, uh, source of evidence uh, comes from a study that looked at five to 10% of recovered patients in Wuhan, China, who had repeated na nasopharyngeal sampling um, and they did have positive samples after several negative samples, but it's unclear whether this reflects um, changes in sampling technique or true persistence or reinfection. So turning now to public health measures for um, the control of the coronavirus epidemic, um, these are measures that actually apply to all epidemics. It's important to have um, surveillance systems that track the number of tests performed and the test results by demographic and geographic features. Um, containment um, are measures that are designed to slow the spread, um, for example, through contact investigation, quarantine, and other activities that are focused at the level of an individual. Mitigation, by contrast, is designed to reduce the severity of an epidemic namely to reduce the incidence, morbidity and mortality, um, and disruptions to um, the economic, political, and social systems. And these are measures um, that are aimed at the community or population level. Um, for example, social distancing and school closures. 
uh, frequent uh, communication of high quality data is always important in any epidemic and protecting the health workforce also is an important public health measure. You've probably all heard the phrase flattening the curve, so I thought I'd just take a moment to explain it. Here in this diagram on the left, you can see the um, epidemic curve in blue um, shows the number of cases along the y-axis is exceeding the healthcare system's capacity, which is the dotted line. When containment and mitigation measures are put in place and are successful, the curve is flattened, so the number of cases are spread out over time along the x-axis so that the healthcare system has the capacity to handle all of these cases. So moving now to treatment, how are people being treated for COVID-19? I wanna emphasize that there are still no specific antiviral treatments, unfortunately, that are recommended for COVID-19. People with COVID-19 should receive supportive care to help relieve their symptoms. And for severe cases, treatment should include care to support vital organ functions. There are now over 50 clinical treatment trials in progress, and I refer you to the clinicaltrials.gov website to find these details. I'm not gonna read to you all of the different types of um, investigational agents that are um, uh, being examined through clinical trials. I'll also note um, there are approximately 40 trials covering new diagnostics, clinical presentation patterns, um, and uh, modes of prevention all in progress. I do want to mention the WHO Solidarity Trial that was announced last week, although many details still remain to be announced about this trial, but it is going to look at four different agents. So it will have four different arms, remdesivir, uh, chloroquine and hydroxychloroquine, ritonavir, lopinavir, and then ritonavir, lopinavir with interferon beta. Um, I'm not going to go through all the details on the slide, but we'll leave it for you as a resource. Um, the outcomes are going to be rather simple, date of discharge, date of death, duration of hospital stay, and need for oxygen or ventilation. And I'll also mention that um, the French research agency, INSERM, um, is adding on a trial named Discovery that is looking at the same drugs as the Solidarity trial with the exception of chloroquine um, and will cover um, the same seven countries um, listed at the bottom of the slide as the solidarity, as the countries, at least at this point, that are going to participate in the solidarity trial. Uh, briefly, I just want to mention that um, there are suggestions from the global community that ibuprofen makes COVID-19 illness worse. Um, however, there's really no clear evidence um, that this is the case. Um, I think this rests on some hypothetical concerns um, about ibuprofen increasing ACE2 expression um, but uh, WHO does not recommend um, against the use of uh, ibuprofen or other non-steroidal anti-inflammatory agents uh, during COVID-19 infection. Convalescent plasma um, has moved into the news recently um, as an approach for either treatment um, or for post-exposure prophylaxis. Um, this is a passive antibody therapy that can prevent or treat an infectious disease. It depends, it's thought to work primarily through virus, viral neutralization, um, but other um, mechanisms are of course also possible. Um, it has a long history of use um, starting from the 1890s and was um, heavily used in the pre-antibiotic era. It has been tried for Ebola, pneumococcal pneumonia, SARS, um, MERS, and COVID-19, but there haven't been any large randomized controlled trials. Um, by contrast, it has been widely used and there's extensive data on safety and efficacy for prevention of hepatitis B, rabies. Certainly when you've heard about people getting rabies shots, that's um, part of what is going on. Uh, botulism and respiratory syncytial virus. You have to have the right dose um, uh, and you have to uh, give it at the right time. Um, so you have to have a high enough antibody titer, um, and it's most effective when given early in the course of illness. There is a good safety profile from the treatment trials, um, but it really is still anecdotal because of the lack of large randomized controlled trials. There are some risks that I've listed there um, at the bottom. Um, 
and I'll say that clinical trial planning is underway for patients um, with um, severe disease and moderate disease and is at an earlier stage for looking at um, pre-symptomatic patients. Um, there are currently five ongoing vaccine trials according to clinicaltrials.gov. These are listed here for you. I really don't have time to um, go into the details, but I'll tell you that for the first one, um, the mRNA-1273 trial, um, the first uh, dose of that was given to the first um, uh, study uh, subject on March 16th. So the vaccine trials are now underway. And I'm going to um, close here with um, a snapshot of COVID-19 in Africa. Um, as of yesterday afternoon, there were about um, 4,000, a little more than 4,000 confirmed cases, 31 deaths, and um, 41 countries or territories um, um, involved. There has been um, a response in uh, African countries, and diagnostic capacity has been established in most countries, at least 40 countries. Surveillance systems are being put in place, and from my uh, survey of the news, it looks like social distancing um, and various levels of lockdowns are in place either in urban centers or across entire countries in about 12 countries. I think we're all too aware of the challenges with um, fragile and ill-prepared um, health, health system infrastructures. Social distancing and frequent hand washing is um, often just not feasible in many settings. Um, there's a limited supply of uh, personal protective equipment and uh, really drastically limited um, numbers of intensive care beds and ventilators. So just to um, summarize here in terms of our epidemiologic takeaways, we know already that we have to continue to expect change. Early on, there were rapid shifts um, in diagnostic um, categories. There will continue to be shifts in diagnostic capacity and guidance from departments of health. Um, I just wanna again mention um, that it's important to interpret mortality rates um, in the early stages of really any outbreak with caution. Um, respiratory droplets via close contact um, is the main way the virus spreads and social distancing is the major public health intervention. In terms of clinical takeaways, um, uh, COVID-19 uh, presents as a flu-like illness for most, and it's really very hard to distinguish between regular influenza and COVID-19. Takes about two weeks to recover from milder illness, uh, longer if um, it's a more severe case, and reinfection after the initial infection appears unlikely. And as we saw with um, the treatment and prevention trials, quite a, a many treatment trials are in progress. Clinical vaccine trials have begun and convalescent plasma trial preparations are underway. Um, here's a list of some um, helpful resources, CDC's um, page, of course, WHO, Africa CDC. PubMed has established a dedicated COVID-19 resource page. Um, the major journals all have um, dedicated resources. Um, the preprint platforms, um, there are quite a few, but I've listed here MedRxiv and BioRxiv are, are quite helpful as ways to see what's coming into the publication pipeline. And there's also a, a covidtracking.com um, website with um, some very helpful data. So I'll close here um, by thanking um, Wafa um, and many of my ICAP colleagues, um, including Connor Wright, who helped me prepare the slides. And um, I think now we have uh, plenty of time to take um, questions and hopefully we'll have answers. And even if we don't, we can at least identify them as important questions to pay attention to. So I'll, I'll stop here. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you. very much, uh, Jessica. Um, I hope you can hear me, everyone. And uh, I encourage everyone to please continue to put your uh, questions in the chat box or uh, so we can tackle them now. Um, I had one question, Jessica, that came up uh, regarding, um, I guess, the performance of the rapid tests and um, that many of the tests that have been developed, uh, and people are raising the question about, you know, the negative predictive value versus uh, the positive predictive value. And uh, what do we know about the, um, the performance of these tests thus far? Um, 
I, I didn't prepare um, any, you know, quantitative estimates for you all um, in terms of general sensitivity and specific, specificity or, or negative predictive value. I mean, I think um, we all know that uh, quite a few factors will go into this, um, starting with the way the sample is collected, if the nasal swab is um, collected properly or not, and then the way it's handled um, when it gets to the lab. There certainly were some problems with um, the reagents um, in the, the control panels for the initial CDC test. Um, so I think, you know, I guess the way I look at these tests is I always, you know, take it with a, a little bit of a grain of salt as to whether a negative test is really a negative test. And it may certainly happen that um, somebody's getting tested before um, the virus can be detected if their symptoms continue to evolve. Um, and it's important clinically to know that they actually have COVID-19, then it would make sense to do another test. I think probably many of us here um, on this morning's webinar know that um, testing is not being done and is not recommended for every single symptomatic person because we don't have a treatment right now. And so it doesn't change the management. Um, but Wafa, feel free to add on if you, if you feel that um, other aspects of, of uh, this question are worth expanding on. Yeah, no, I think you, you're, you're right, uh, Jessica. And I think part of the issue with these nasopharyngeal swabs is obviously the sampling. But I think it's recommended that sometimes if um, you get a negative in a highly suspected case is to repeat the test, mm -hmm. you know, as, as another way of, uh, to, to address this issue. Um, there's another question about testing and the potential for home-based testing uh, was raised. Do you have any information on home-based testing as of yet? Well, yeah, let me, well, I, I showed a slide on that. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, right now FDA does not approve any of these. Um, I think you can find them on the internet. Um, you would collect your own swab. The turnaround time varies, um, you know, without any um, F FDA assessment or approval, it's really, I, I'd say, a total unknown uh, what the performance of these tests are. I wouldn't recommend them. I think in the future, um, it's possible that high quality tests that are self tests, sorry, high quality self tests will become available in the future, but we're not there right now. Thank you. Another test, another question, uh, you mentioned the testing for antibodies and the question was, where, what is the status of, uh, do you know where they're at now, such serologic tests? Um, well, as I, as I mentioned, they are being developed and um, even moved to the market. Um, they're um, in, in my slide on this, I'm not, I could go back. Should I try to go back? I'm not gonna go back to the earlier slides. Um, there was um, a very nice preprint um, from Amanat and colleagues from the Kramer, Florian Kramer's uh, group at Mount Sinai um, published um, as a preprint, a study on the serologic test and, and its um, performance characteristics where they actually didn't quantify sensitivity and specificity, but um, noted that it looked very promising. They were working with um, a small number of uh, COVID positive samples to, to um, validate their test. Again, I think this is moving quickly. Um, these tests, I am going to say, are, are rapidly going to become available. Great, thank you. Another question was about the solidarity, the WHO um, study, and uh, maybe a touch on the eligibility criteria. Are they, um, is it broad eligibility criteria, like including mild, moderate, severe disease, so we can look at um, maybe potential progression from mild to more severe illness? Um, well, there's actually surprisingly little detail on the WHO website um, about the trial. Um, but from what I can tell, it's for patients who are hospitalized. Uh -huh. um, and all that a physician has to do is fill out a relatively simple form um, with some limited information about the patient's characteristics. And then the physician has to also indicate which of the four medications are available um, at that hospital. And then WHO will do the randomization, again, based on the availability of the four different agents at that hospital, 
um, and, and then the person would receive the assigned agent. Um, so it, you know, it's something I think we would consider a pragmatic trial. Certainly it's not got, um, you know, any kind of double blind control to it, but, but there is um, at least randomization. So then you'd have to have at least two of these available at your facility, right? That would make sense, yes. Okay. So that kind of limits potentially the, um, the enrollment. Uh, there was um, back and forth on the chat box regarding the issue of uh, the men versus women. We know that um, about 57% of cases thus far, confirmed cases, I know at least in the US have been amongst men and uh, the rest amongst women. But there also are indications that it appears that men have more severe symptoms and um, just there've been, I'll, I'll tell you, they've been kind of going back and forth on the chat box that this might be uh, due to a couple of reasons and maybe you can expand on any others you can think of is that men uh, are known to have more is two receptors that um, also, um, you know, men in the, from the China series are more likely to be smokers and therefore have underlying lung disease and, um, um, you know, there are lots of potential reasons for it. And, and also, I think that we've known that for some conditions, at least, that women do better than men, maybe because of their immune response. Um, what, do you, what are your thoughts, Jessica, in terms of the, and if it's true that there is a differential between men and women? Um, well, my understanding from the uh, um, experience in China is that um, people with cardiovascular disease, diabetes, and, and chronic lung disease had worse outcomes than those who did not have those conditions. Um, and again, I think, you know, in many parts of the world, more men than women um, have, uh, sort of have been smokers. And I think that might um, go along with the cardiovascular disease and the chronic lung disease and might point to some of the differences that we see in presentation between men and women. Um, I would guess that, you know, there are going to be many women who are having milder disease and are not getting captured um, as a confirmed case. So that, you know, what we're looking at is a simply a reflection of the fact that we are primarily testing those with more severe symptoms rather than testing everybody. Um, those are my thoughts. Yeah. And then there's also the, the question was raised about ACE inhibitors, ARBs inhibitors, and w whether they could make things worse. Um, that are useful hypertension. Sorry, would ACE inhibitors make things worse? Yes. Whether, whether, I mean, nobody knows. But, uh, right, nobody knows. And that, that is actually, um, when you go in onto the clinicaltrials.gov website and, and go through the details on there, there um, are some trials um, looking to see um, what the role is of, of ACE2 inhibitors and whether even a recombinant ACE2 inhibitor might make things better by blocking the receptor and not allowing the virus um, to attach to the ACE2 um, receptor. I think another so question is that being on an ACE2 that, ACE that being on an ACE2 inhibitor would make the receptors more numerous. Yes, yeah. mm -hmm. right. But I, I think we really just don't know. So the theories can go in both directions. Okay, thank you, um, Eric. I think you're watching the Q and A chat. I'm watching the chat box. If there are other questions that are arriving through the other route, uh, let me know. Another question is, <clears throat> if people uh, die primarily due to their immune response to the virus like a cytokine storm, why aren't more immunosuppressive drugs being tried in clinical trials? Um, well, um, I, I was thinking about including a slide about um, the role of um, glucocorticosteroids and, and um, immune agents. Um, I'd say that the um, consensus right now is that um, steroids, glucocorticosteroids are not helpful, and that's based more on experience with um, prior um, coronavirus outbreaks um, where this was studied in more detail and really no benefit was seen. And in fact, in, some, in many cases, um, it really seemed um, to, uh, to be a, a, a disadvantage to receive gluc glucocorticoids. Um, so it's not recommended to use steroids for COVID-19. Um, there are some 
trials looking at monoclonal antibodies um, that have immunomodulatory effects. So I would say, you know, that's under assessment right now, um, but it's certainly not part of standard therapy yet because we just don't know. I mean, one of the issues that have been raised in the, con the concern and the caution with regards to whether we use uh, convalescent uh, serum from patients who recovered or potential vaccine is the concern that you um, is um, that Teresa is actually raising. Teresa Gamble is that um, there there is some experience in SARS, the first SARS, that uh, you could actually potentially worsen. Um, at least the, the pulmonary function, the respiratory status with the, um, um, based on the, um, because of like immune, almost like a, an immune uh, response reaction, like an right reaction, yeah. Right, no, I mean, it, it, it's, um, I think categorizes, uh, it referred to as antibody dependent enhancement of, of the infection. Um, and and that, that is one of the risks. Um, I think the convalescent plasma trials are going to start with people um, who are severely ill. Um, you know, I think what I'll, I'll reflect on here is I think that, you know, when we were dealing with the Ebola outbreak and, and the mortality rates were so high, um, uh, you know, there were the thought was, we'll try almost anything. Anything would, would be an improvement to these just you know, astound, astoundingly high mortality rates. I think with COVID-19, you know, Teresa, you and, and others with these kinds of concerns, you're making a very important point. I mean, you know, it's not the same mortality rate as with Ebola, although when you are looking at severely ill patients where mortality rate in ICUs has been in the 50 to 60% range, I think, you know, you then feel prepared to try a wider range of, of therapies to see if something will make a difference. Um, so I'm going to say, yes, I agree that there are going to be these concerns that it could make things worse. And that's why it's important to do the study um, and, and see if that's actually the case with this um, current SARS coronavirus too. And then one question regarding um... Uh, modeling. Um, there have been a lot of models that have been developed by many modeling groups around the world. And um, But one of the questions is uh, about, uh, has there been any modeling of of the uh, pandemic or uh, and its impact in Africa? Uh, I'm sure that there have been. I have not um, specifically reviewed those. So I can't actually um, give an answer to that. Maybe we have somebody on the call who can speak to that. I'm not aware of any, I'm aware of work that's been done to look at uh, which countries in Sub-Saharan Africa is um, most likely to, um, to, to be severely impacted uh, by COVID-19. And that's been largely, so that's not truly modeling, it's based, really based on an analysis of the health systems, uh, several factors, including mm -hmm. uh, connection to the world, like uh, yep countries that have uh, hubs like Nairobi and uh, Lagos and Cairo and Addis Ababa and Johannesburg like have connections to more connections to the world and therefore more travel travelers arriving that uh, that's one parameter another parameter has been um, you know the density of the population ur urbanis urbanicity as well as also then uh, the severity depending on diagnostic capabilities and health system capabilities that's what I've seen uh, uh, in terms of analysis of the in potential impact on different African countries. And it looks like actually based on uh, those initial um, analyses that what's happening now in Africa is consistent with what was anticipated. Right. And I, I remember, I'm remembering, um, again, they were not truly models, but um, by looking at the pattern of um, flights between China um, and other parts of the world, and in particular, um, Wuhan and other parts of the world, um, there were predictions that um, cases were going to be seen in certain locations um, in Africa. Um, as I recall, um, even uh, pointing out the, the frequent um, connections between Wuhan and Egypt, and some of the earliest cases in Africa did start in Egypt. Um, so that was consistent with that 
analysis of flight patterns. Thank you. And then maybe here, and, and maybe last question, unless I get some more, uh, was um, as follows. Allowing the health system to cope is obviously very important. Uh, what are other advantages of flattening the curve? Um, well, another um, important advantage is um, it allows time for, um, for those of us who are um, treating these patients to refine the um, management. Um, you know, I think there are many sophisticated details about the best way to support respiratory function that have been involving the right way to use a ventilator and when to prone a patient and all the ventilator settings, people are getting better at that. So over time, I think the um, management of the critically ill has, has been improving. Um, and with more time, hopefully we will um, begin to see some of the results of um, some of the clinical trials. Um, I have heard that perhaps by the end of April, we'll have a, a, a good sense of um, whether remdesivir is um, having an impact on those with severe illness. Um, or moderate illness. So that's another advantage besides allowing the health system to cope um, is to have a better knowledge of how best to manage patients and perhaps even treat them. And then one question is about in areas of the world where hand washing and social distancing is not feasible, feasible what prevention or risk reduction strategies are recommended? Um, well, this isn't anything official. Um, this is just my own, <laughs> my own thought is, you know, perhaps if there's a way to add a little bit of bleach into a bucket of water and then have people just dip their hands in that bucket of water. Again, you have to have the water um, to do that, but it wouldn't require running water. Um, and I think um, communication campaigns, um, sort of, you know, information communication education campaigns that um, just explain to people why it's important to try to stay farther apart from each other would also be critical. It goes back to that principle of communication. Um, but I'm sure there are going to be other ideas as well on, on how to uh, actually put these measures into place in, in settings where it's not going to be easy. Yeah, I know that uh, you, we saw a, a very interesting uh, photograph of um, these portable hand washing stands mm. that were uh, is put in place right next to big uh, bus stations in Rwanda, which I think mm -hmm. is interesting, um, is an interesting way of, and, and nobody, essentially nobody can get on the bus and, until you wash your hands. Uh, in other places we've seen, uh, like our team has been setting up, you know, these uh, hand washing uh, stands also with instructions and so on. So I, I guess that, you know, again, like you're saying, to at least try to adjust uh, as much as possible. And then, of course, some of the, some of the countries have put in place social distancing measures like, uh, which are uh, very difficult to implement, but like closing markets and, of course, um, uh, pausing uh, church attendance and so on until exactly. uh, until the this uh, epidemic is under control so you know countries are trying their best under very difficult circumstances so well, but there's one last question yes go ahead come up, uh, the, whether temperature and humidity may have impact on the epidemic ah. and whether you know with a two degree rise in Wuhan yes. would that have sort of started to flatten the curve and is that what we saw in Hong Kong and Singapore so um, there's, um, there, has, there has been research looking at the um, effect of temperature and humidity on transmission of influenza. Um, in particular, um, in animal models, um, where you have one cage of uh, influenza infected guinea pigs next to a cage of uninfected uh, guinea pigs, I believe guinea pigs is the model, and their transmission really is much more efficient um, with colder temperature and, and drier humidity compared to higher temperature and higher humidity. And certainly we see that, you know, at a very big scale in the epidemiologic patterns of influenza, where, which typically goes away as the weather warms up. I, I don't believe that um, there's ev enough evidence yet to say whether this is going to happen with COVID-19. 
Um, so we're going to just have to wait it out. Um, I, 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 I think it'll be interesting. Um, and the other big question is, is it going to come back again um, in about six months from now? Um, will it become endemic and just continue, you know, all year round or cycle the way flu does from the Northern hemisphere to the Southern hemisphere? Um, these are all really important questions. And last question, I'm sensitive to time, is what about, uh, and then we will uh, close the webinar and thank everybody. What is the likelihood of fecal oral transmission? Um, I think that it's um, really quite low. Um, I, I did look at some um, studies to see how often the virus had been isolated from different kinds of body fluids. Um, and it was um, occasionally, I'm looking for my notes, there we go. Um, it was um, isolated from some stool samples um, in some studies. Um, it was never found in urine. Um, it's never been found in vaginal fluids. These are all really small studies. Um, it's only found um, in blood at the very end stages of the illness. It's almost always found in saliva, like 90%, um, and not found in breast milk. And so the way I look at that is, you know, I think perhaps by some saliva and swallowing some respiratory secretions, then it may get into the stool. On the other hand, the ACE2 receptor is in, you know, the small intestine. It's possible that there's an active infection going on in the small intestine and that might explain the findings of the stool samples. But those stool samples, as I said, it was not, you know, 90%. One study, it was half. Um, so I'm going to say it's another area that needs, a, you know, more rigorous research. Great. Well, thank you very much. I'd like to uh, thanks, Jessica, and thanks, Nero and Eric, for organizing this um, this webinar and uh, please do continue to send your questions, uh, not through the chat box obviously, but to Eric Miller and we'll try to answer them. Thanks again, everyone and have a good day or a good evening. Thanks, okay. Rafa. And I do wanna just uh, indicate that we will post the video as well as uh, the recording, as well as the slides on our HPTN website, www.hptn.org. Okay, great. Thank you everybody. Thank, Thank you. you. Have a good day.